And I know from looking around this room, I see people that I'm honored to be up here. But I was also raised to believe and taught this is a very reverent place. Standing back here, you better you better have the right intention and you better have your heart right with God when you stand up here. It's dangerous if you don't. Now I look around the room and I see guys that I feel like back in my day I feel like I'm back where you are. Some of you are still making decisions daily that you're facing right or wrong. When you make a decision, you're deciding whether you want to do right or do wrong. You're still there. Some of you, it's not a matter of right and wrong anymore. It's a matter of left or right and knowing that God will be with you no matter which direction you go. And young and old alike, I look at Pastor Bruce. What a shepherd. He, I mean, he, I don't even think he realizes sometimes what he means to so many people in his walk for God. I know what he means to me. Because I was searching for this church for 30 years. When we moved from Louisville here, I had been looking for this church for 30 years. And then I looked at Isaiah. Hey, he's so deep in the word that it, it, it makes me littler to get up here, honestly. Get a little bit when I get up here, when I see people that know so much and get so much out of God's Word that I feel like I miss sometimes. And then I, I, I see guys like Losey over here and Kyle like Losey. He, he, he gets up here the first time I see him get up here, and, he, and you think he'd been up here all his life. You know, I mean, it just it's effortless for some people. I'm not those people. Uh, I look at Colin and, and, and sometimes it makes me wish I could go back in my life and start my walk like he did and like he is God's on him yes. you know God's blessing everything you can look at his life God's blessing everything he's doing but guys it's not something that none of you any of you could do the same thing but we don't we don't. In my life, when I get through, you realize I had no excuses. Mm -hmm. I had no excuses whatsoever <coughs> for the mess that I made in my life. Yes. But over the years, my life has been in like three phases. Uh, all of them are so clear now, looking back. And I'm probably one of the oldest people in this building. And, and I'm proud to be here. I'm proud that God has brought me this far because what he had to do to get me up here to this day is nothing short of an action. And we'll get on with it. You know, it, it's, it's like the first scripture I wanted to read was Romans 12, 1 through 2. And I, and I had, I bet I had 30 verses that I could have brought. And then I realized over the last couple of days, if I got up here and said everything, that God has laid on my heart in the last four weeks, I realized something. Me being up here today took 64 years. It did not take a month of preparing this. It's been 64 years that God has been preparing this. Right. And I have stood for many a people, but I don't count any of those. I, I have ran some of the largest factories in the state of Kentucky. And I have 150 employees. I have eight, 10, 15 supervisors under me. 
And even in the circular world, in the secular side, in the, in the walk that you all do every day, in your jobs, it's like I was a leader. I was the person that, I, and when I would face my days, this is to me like the Monday morning of the secular world. You know, everybody dreads it. Nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to do it. You want to stay in the bed, you know, because it's hard. And then today it was like, you know, this is something I'm uncomfortable in, but, but yet God's done so much for me. Why wouldn't I share it? Amen. Amen. You know, and, 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 and I don't know, you know, I, I look at all of you and, and I think <coughs> some of you may not even know your biological parents. And a lot of you were probably, that was the closest people to you in your life. I listened to my buddy over here talking. And even in the passing of his mother, what she was to him ended up being fulfilled in her words, and he's here. I mean, he's here because what his mom wanted him to do from far away, not even around here, what she wanted him to do was here. And there he sits and, and, and got stories, lots of stories. You know, God's working something in this man that someday he'll look back and he'll have greater stories than I could ever start to tell. You know, and, and that's the same for every one of y'all. And, and, and it's like when I was conceived, it was an accident. And, and I'm looking around this room, and I don't know how many of y'all's parents planned you. I don't know how many of your parents said, I want that son, and I want him to be Andy. Mine wasn't that way. I had the best parents in the world. My parents were godly people. And, and, and I'm talking about a father that no matter where you met him, whether it's a workplace in Louisville, where it was, he was a godly man that had love. Amen. He, 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 he didn't beat anybody up with, with the word, but he knew that word front to back. Never beat anybody up. All he done was love. He never done anything else. The day he died, he filled up a funeral. There was people coming from everywhere all over the land. There was people I talked to after his death that I had no idea that my father had ever even crossed paths with it. But they had the same story to tell about my father. And let me tell you something, guys. You, you know, we got Christ as an example. He is the exact same example that I just pictured in my father. I struggled with knowing I had no excuses. You know, I related that to my earthly father. But when we go through God's word, he has given us everything that we need to walk that same walk. We don't have to get upset or mad if we're driving down the road and something happens that causes us to be angry. Amen. Or to get up and vent. Like, one of the struggles I've always had was with my wife and my family. I, I tend to hurt people's feelings trying to do good. Is that, I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Yes, sir. But I hurt people's feelings sometimes trying to be a good person, trying to be what God wants me to be. <laughs> and before I left the house this morning, or after I leave, I told my wife, I said, pray that God uses me, but that I don't hurt anybody's feelings. You know, because we get human, we all get human. And when we get human, we make bad decisions. And those decisions for some of us can be eternal. And, and that is the reason I'm here. I'm not here to stop you from making mistakes. I'm not here to tell you there's a curve ahead, slow down. I'm here to tell you that the mistakes that you make today could very well determine your eternity. And, and if you can't stand of eternity, get in God's word and start learning what eternity is and the differences between <coughs> that. But I'm here hopefully, and, and my topic would have been today if I, if I stayed on topic, and I can already tell you, I have not stayed on topic. I have spent weeks writing stuff down, 
when I look at it now, yeah, the story's there. The story's there. The story's in you all. The story's in me. It's in you all. And as, as much as we try to fight sometimes what God has for us, we have to do what he wants us to do eventually. Amen. Now, a little bit about my background. Like y'all already know, I come from a godly home, godly parents. Born in Cleveland, Ohio. Bad neighborhood. Raised in Louisville. Bad neighborhood. I was a, I was not conceived by a plan. Or so I would have thought. But I have a sister that we're the same age for three weeks every year. We're the same age for three weeks every year. That was not planned. No parent is going to plan that. If any of y'all got little kids in your life, no parent's going to plan that. You know, that's like saying you hate yourself. But between diapers and cooking and feeding, and then it brings me to this church again. We have got almost a complete body. Because Christ describes the church as a body. Everybody in here is a part of that body. Whether you're a finger or like Bruce. Bruce is the top. He's the shepherd. He is our shepherd. He's, the, he's this part up here that leads us Amen. with wisdom. And when I hear him preach, I'm in awe. Amen. You know, and I had sat under some of the greatest leaders that there's ever been in God. I mean, I have sat, and some of y'all won't know these names, but I have sat at a Jerry's restaurant in Louisville with Dottie Rambo and Bessel Goodman at 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. I've sat at tables with them and that. These are big people, big names. I have been around these people. And I, and I was talking to Josh yesterday, I think it was, Perry Stone. If any of y'all know Perry Stone, and you don't know him, look him up. When you get a chance, to look up Perry Stone Ministry. This man is a prophetic man that I grew up with, that I'm in awe of these guys. But in all of them, I realized that God put every one of these people in my life that were just little fragments of who I am. And if God allows... I have more years. You know, I, I have got another time that I know I will speak. I fought it. And I know there's another time that I'm going to have to speak. And it's solely because of where I had been in my life and the measures that God had to take to get me here. Now, I... Like I said, everybody knows I come from a great family. But in Louisville, when I was raised, I was raised in church. And through the worst times of my life, and being the worst person that I've ever been, I was in church on Sunday morning. I was at church on Wednesday night. I was at church on Sunday night. There were people that did not know what a rotten, foul person that I really was. And, and get this, my wife, I, I had, I've been married twice. My first marriage lasted four months. And four months, just four months. But through that marriage, I ended up with a son. And he's 40, be 44. But he's a great person now. I didn't get him to 14 because his mother, when she left, it, it was just a matter of her, she missed her family, and they missed her, and they bribed her. They would do anything to get her back home. She was from France and Milan, New Mexico. You know, and that's another part of my life and stories that I could tell. I traveled a lot and been a lot of places. But at 14, he became a big part of my life. And he didn't... He didn't know everything about my life, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, my wife. We've been married 43 years. She don't never. She don't know everything about me because I'm ashamed of a lot of who I am Amen. and who I was. 
But every day that I wake up, I remember that person was in there. You know, I, I remember. You know, I don't I don't struggle with choices and decisions anymore. I quit fighting God. I quit fighting God because guys, you wear yourself out. And a lot of churches now they dumb down Christianity. They really do. Because you all can't be good enough to be Christian. And there's a lot of churches that feel that way. So what they do, they start taking on people's ears. They start telling them what they want to hear. Bruce don't do that. These guys, John, they don't do that. They're not going to do that in up your meetings. Because they're going to be accountable for every word they say, just like you all are. The only difference is they're doing it from a leadership position behind this pulpit. You know, this this may be 30 or 40 minutes, 50 minutes of your all's life that after I get down, I don't have to worry about it anymore because I put it out there, you know, and then I'm done. They come up here weekly and do this. Y'all, that's a load. <laughs> that is a load. But I had my first daughter after my son. My, my wife, when she left that time, she was pregnant. And I have never to this day, I put her on a plane in a little, and to this day I had never seen her again to this day. And like I said, I got my son when he was 14, and I'm proud of him. He turned into a good man. But it was like he had been told a lot of things that weren't true, which, you know, at that time I'd have probably done the same thing. You know, if, if you want to sever ties with somebody, you tell them how awful the other person is. So, you know, it just makes it better, right? Well, at 14, he wasn't better because they called me. He was actually in a lot of bad shape. But God turned everything around. He owned several companies out in Elko, Nevada. I see him all the time. I talk to him weekly. He's my friend. Because I couldn't be bad for a big part of his life. But... Now, I'm his friend and his dad. But it, it's like some of you face that same thing in your life, you know, on the other side of the coin. But then I met my wife and I'm married to now. And like I said, you already know it's 43 years. She's a wonderful woman. She's a better person than I am. See, there's two things that make it hard for me to be up here. And one of them is the very fact that I get emotional if I start talking about the personal things of my life and the people that I love. But it's partly because God gave them to me. And you, you, when God gives you stuff sometimes, you'll find yourself wanting them to make them what you want them to be. And we don't have that. That's not a burden that God really put on us. Yeah, you raise your kids. The Bible says if you raise them up in the way they should go, that they'll not part from it. And I have to find myself holding on to that every day. You know, any of you guys that come to church here much, you know, I come along a lot, but a lot of times I've got a lot with me too. And that's just, it's something that has always bothered me. It always bothered me. And, and I, I realized that my wife is a better person than me, but I'm the one that's here to her all the time. Is there something wrong with that picture? Or is that how God formed it? Because he knew the two of us together would do the things that we done. Her being different than me is not necessarily godly or ungodly. But we had our daughter, and when my daughter was born, by my wife and Anna, my wife is 15 years old. I was a Christian. My wife was 15 years old and having our first child, and I was 21. Now, guys, if you do the math on that, that was a criminal act. Okay? I was a Christian. And you would have thought the day that she was born, she was three pounds or something, three pounds, 11 ounces. Smallest child they had in that hospital in Louisville. But yet she was the healthiest child they had in that hospital in Louisville. And I had to make a choice between her mother and her 
And at that time, we weren't even married. At that time, when I had to make that choice, they had to call in extra <coughs> security at that hospital because there were 13 women there that wanted nothing more than to throw me out of a third-story window and watch me die for what I'd done. Because what I'd done was, it was a sin, the one, no doubt. It was wrong, and I didn't know how bad it was until I had my own kids. I've got daughters now, and there was some deceit that took place that brought me there, but I still was there. And looking back, like I said, that wasn't the end of the story, but it could have been. You know, I could have been in prison, and worse things than that could have happened. I could have lost my wife that day that my daughter was born. And I remember so many times the first segment of my life. You know, we all got our stories as a kid. We all can look back and see when we were a kid. But I had seven years of my life. I was kicked out of public schools by the time I was 16 and a little. What even 16? I was smart, but I was not wise. And, and I got in a lot of trouble all the time. But yet, still, Sunday morning, I was at church. <laughs> Wednesday night, I was at church. And being at church does not mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. You can come in here, you can sit on them pews, you can go through the motions. It doesn't mean anything. Amen. And I was there, and like I said, I was a person that had no excuses. But through that, I was the thorn in the flesh for my parents because, like I said, it was a Christian home. And I was living two lives, and I was everything but a Christian. And I knew God. I knew the ins and outs, the ups and downs, and the, everything that he could do to me because of how I was living. But yet, somehow or other, I lost the focus on that when I was not in that church and I was out there on that street in Louisville, I lost the focus on what God could do to me where I was. And, and a lot of this that I had, like I said, I'm not even, it's not even what I was going to talk about. It was as far as like knowing God's will, seeing God's will, you will get that out of this by the time I'm through. But I have had twice in my life, and this is the other story. I knew, I know someday I'll, I'll be up here telling this story, or I'll be somewhere telling this story because it was too big to keep in. I went through things in my life to where there was two times in my life, and one of them wasn't a hard time, but yet it was a time I needed God more than I ever, ever could have imagined that I needed God. But he put an angel in front of me, and I wasn't alone when this happened. There was another man with me when this happened. But he put an angel in front of me. And the story that takes from that day to this day, it all makes sense now. And then there was another time that God showed me a vision. And, and these all tie in together. But he took me behind the veil. He let me go behind the veil and see what's taking place in, in your own spiritual realm, in my spiritual realm. And he let me see what was taking place on the other side of that veil. And guys, that is a story that I will have to tell someday. Lydia, Isaiah's mom said, yeah, you've got to tell that. And I do. I know I do. And I will. And, and I looked around this morning and it was like, man, this is the biggest crowd job I've ever had here on a Saturday morning. Why am I here? Why is it me? Why, why did you bring all these guys out? And I know Andy tells me these guys are here because it's voluntary. They don't have to be here. You know, and then a lot of, some of you guys are here just because you love me and you're supporting me. Amen. 
But let me tell you, things aren't always what they look like on the surface. You know, if I ask any one of y'all that have known me more than an hour, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? <coughs> you know, we, we can we can paint pictures <laughs> all day long, but I need to get on with what God's wanting me to show, what God's wanting me to read, because we need to know this. You guys need to know this. We all need to know this. I brought my Bible because I was afraid technology would fail me. <laughs> and by the way, guys, if any of y'all, this is no different than any other time we're here in this building. This altar, if God lays it on your heart, don't pass up that moment. I passed up that moment a lot in my life. And I walked a path that was full of stuff. <laughs> and I'm always going to call it stuff. It was sin. It wasn't nothing but sin. But you don't want you don't want to speak to all the white walker, man. You really don't. <clears throat> all right, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the renewing of your mind right there. that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, God has a will for each and every one of you. And like I said, there was three stages of my life. There was seven years from the time I was about 15, 16 that I was walking in the permissive will of God. Now, the difference between perfect will and permissive will is different for everyone. And to walk in God's perfect will, when I say that and I see those words and I think about that, I can look around this room and I see Bruce and I see Tyler and I see Colin and Lois. I see so many people, so many of you guys, that you've already, in my eyes, like you're in the perfect will of God. You're taking care of your families. You're taking care of business. You're doing what God wants you to do. And you're doing it with God. You're not living two lives. I lived two lives and wanted to be in the perfect will of God. You can't do that. Guys, it's not ever going to happen. And that's why I said some of you guys right now, you're at a point. You're off with God. <coughs> Maybe you don't even think you have a walk with God and you're just here because Greg and Biscuits are here. I don't know. But God has a purpose for you, the same as he did me. And everything in my life, like I said, those seven years, I was in church and I was sinning with the best of them. I mean, I was literally, I had been left in a ditch by seven men to die. If it had not been for a friend of my brother's that just happened to be walking by, and why he was there, he couldn't even tell you. And that's where I would have died. That's where I would have been. But the good thing was, when it all happened, I was numb. You know, I was already numb before they started on me. And God didn't allow that to happen. He didn't allow it. And I deserved it. I truly deserved it. For my very purpose of being where I was at that time, I deserved death. But God came along with his life and what he done and made it able for me to be who I am today. Amen. I have, some of you guys, many of y'all have been to my farm. I have got one of the prettiest farms in this county. It is a peaceful place. I've got animals. <laughs> God's blessed me. And, and 
And do I have wealth? No, I don't have wealth. But my wealth is in you guys. Amen. My wealth Amen. is in that family that God, yeah. I shouldn't have had that family. Now, y'all heard the start of my life. My first wife left after we were married four months. I didn't even see my son until he was 14. I had to make a choice between my wife, who was 15, and my daughter for her to survive. But God blessed it, and I got both of them. Four or three years later, and that's not even that's not even a small part of it. I have got eight kids that have my name. Four of them are adopted. The other four, they're my kids. You know, but all of them are mine. And if you don't be off all my Facebook, you'll see another three, four, five. They call me dad. I was a foster parent for years. Now, guys, my start was horrible. I proved at that point that I could not be responsible for even my own life, much less somebody else's. So now, here I am with 20-some-odd grandkids, two great-grandkids, and 14 kids that call me back. I don't even know how that's possible. I look back and that was, that wasn't in the first seven years of me and my will and my plans because my plans were not any of those. But then I come to the second phase of my life where I started walking a different walk with God. And it started the day that I held that three pound an 11 ounce child in my hand. And, and what I realized is I had walked those years without purpose. And I was in a church. I had a great family. They loved me. But I had no purpose. I had everything. Working for a motor company. I had it made at 17, the youngest man that's ever been hired at Ford Motor Company in Louisville and Firm Valley Road. I had everything. But I didn't have purpose. Now, what you find is your purpose is going to be different than what mine was. But once I had that purpose, I was not perfect in the will of God, even then. But it started something. I can't remember which preacher it was the other day. Held something up and he said, see that, look at that. That is two mustard seeds. That's all the faith God says that we have to have to change this world, to move them out. I had mountains of sin in my life, and they were only there because I put them there. But I could not move those mountains without that mustard seed. You know, and that takes me back to what I just read to you guys. You know, it, in God's word is the answer to everything that you will ever face. Amen. We all come from dirt. You realize that? We all come from dirt. That's it. Dirt. <coughs> when you see a cow out there eating grass, and if you love steak, Guess what? That grass comes from dirt. When you see a pretty flower or a vegetable garden, it comes from dirt. Look what God done with dirt. Seriously, yeah. look what God done with dirt. I, I, I'm amazed at sometimes at who He does pick and who He does choose. You know, when you talk about the body of the church, it's kind of like some churches without a hand. They're walking around without a hand. One of you could be the hand that's needed in a church or in somebody else's life that you're that part of God's body that he needs. 
<laughs> what our women do in this church on a Sunday is amazing. Yes. Guys, it's not just us out here working. We're all part of that body. Yeah. You might not be nothing but a fingernail. But try ripping one of your fingernails off and tell me what it does to you. I know, without a doubt, I couldn't do what them women do on a Sunday. I have started, I'm retired now. And my wife still works. My girls are in school, two of them, that I still have at home. I started cooking for them pretty often. I would not want to be here on a Sunday doing what them women do for all of us. You know, and, and, and Bruce telling his story of his hay trouble last week. Yeah. That's hard work, guys. But guess what? It ain't nothing in my mind like what they do on Sunday. These women are doing that for God. What part of the body of Christ do they end up being? It's greater than you think. Yeah. I think it's this part. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because they do something with their heart for God that none of you would want to do. Right? Oh, I say you wouldn't want to do. You might. I don't know. We're all different. And to close this out, you know, I, I had a ton of other scriptures, but I think you all have got the point of what I'm trying to say. You all are at a point, a lot of you, that you're still doing the right or wrong. And you know it. You know it. You, God already tells you that, you know. You don't need me or anybody else to beat you up about right or wrong. You're all adults. We're adults in here, guys. We know right and wrong. I don't care what side of the street you came from. We know. Some of you are at the right or left moment. And I, and I had a, even a video that had words on it that I wanted to play for y'all to hear. Because it spoke things better than I ever could. It was 14 minutes long. But it talks about the wheel that God has for your life. You get to a point with God, if you take Romans 12, 1 and 2, and you read that and you apply it to your life, and then think, okay? Think. You're a part of the body of God. And we're all going to be different because we all have a different purpose to serve. We've all got scars. Every one of y'all, you got scars. I don't care if it's from a job. I don't care if it's in your heart from a loved one. Every one of you has scars. And I look at my body and I've got scars because I lived. You know? And then I start thinking about the scars that Jesus bore because I could live with my scars. If it weren't for him, these scars wouldn't mean anything. If it wasn't for his scars, my life wouldn't have no meaning at all. And that's body and heart. Every one of you have got scars. But God can take those scars and turn them into something greater than you. Christ had scars. Churches in this community, they have scars. And like I said, some of them are missing hands. Some of them are missing feet. They can't walk past their own door, but they have a, a shepherd. And they have a hand, but they don't have feet. What part of the body of God, what is God's perfect will for you? You know, if you live in God's permissive will, I got news for you. You'll make it to heaven. I've done that for the second phase of my life. I lived in God's permissive will. And the permissive will, <clears throat> i tell you what it brings. You can lay down at night and you can go to sleep. You can sleep. You can rest. You go about your business. You'll have a family. They'll love you, you'll love them. 
But in permissive will, you've got to understand one thing about God. He will permit you to do a lot of things. He will even permit Satan to come into your life to make you a better person. Permissive will has and always will have consequences. You know, it don't take you out, but you'll pay the price. And those consequences will be there in God's permissive will. And it's just because he loves you. That's the only reason that he has permissive will. He loves you. If we had to live by the law, and one thing my dad always told me, don't live by the law, son. Because he said, if you try to live by one law in God's word, you would be held responsible for every law in God. And if any of you all have ever read the law of God, children of Israel could be judged. Those that walked this earth with God's Son, God on the earth, in flesh, couldn't do it. So if you think for one moment that you can walk in the law, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Moses did not get to see the promised land. You know why? God told him, to speak to that rock because there were shepherds, sheep and people that had had water. They were thirsty. There was a lot of tests and trials going on when God told him, you speak to that rock. Him and Aaron, and it was the word, speak to that rock. But when he got to that rock, he hit that rock with his staff. Now, people argue that he didn't have faith that God was good. And then there's some that will tell you he was just wanting to show himself that he was taking his glory away from God by hitting that stone. Because there are stones in that region, in the Middle East, that God made it this way in the desert, but they contain water. And anyone can go up to them rocks. If you know what you're looking at, you know, like these shepherds that's over there, they can hit a rock in a certain place and water will come out of that rock. Isn't it amazing what God can do? But he took the glory away from God because if he had said, if he had walked up to that rock and said what God said to say, he kept that rod and staff in his hand, which God told him to take that rod up with him. If you read the story, <coughs> God put that rod in his hand. But he did not speak to the stone so that God would get all the glory. He hit that rod with that rod. Water still came for him. Permissive will of God. Water still came out of that rod. But guess what? He didn't get the promise land. Something that God had molded him for. Something that he, like me, he had trouble speaking in front of people. And he had to speak in front of millions of people. Literally. And lead them. But he didn't make it to the promise land. Now, will he be in heaven? He's going to be there. He was used to God. But because of living in permissive will, he didn't see the promised land. Guys, we're no different. Get out of being in God's permissive will. Be transformed by the renewing of you. You. He means you. Through his work. Stop conforming to this world. Stop thinking that through God's permissive will that you can be a part of both sides. Because that permissive will is going to let you decide. Now the third phase of my life, and this will be the end of it. When you get to a point where 
It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's not a matter of permissive will or perfect will. It's faith in you to know that whether I go off the stage on that side or if I go off on that side, God's going to be with me on that walk. But he's not going to be there because he forced himself to be there. He's going to be there because I let him be there. I want him there. Amen. At my age, I'm looking towards the end. I want God to be with me no matter which side of this stage I go off of and where I leave when I leave this driveway out here. I want God to be in that walk with me. My time is short. My time may be long. Your time may be short. Mine may be longer than yours. I could be the oldest man in here and outlive every one of you all. That could actually happen. But I believe we're in a time God's coming back. And he's coming back for a church that is a full body. And the only thing I would say is, guys, find what part of God's body you are. We're not all the same in God's walk. What he has for you is different than me. I'm just lucky to be my age and look back and see what he brought me through to get to where I am. It is an honor and a blessing to know I don't deserve to be up here. I don't. But here I here I was. Here I am. You know? As bad as I hated to get up here and I had anxiety in this, and this bunch of papers didn't mean anything at all. Really? I didn't know. I mean, they were good things like a tree. I could see that tree, but when I got there, it didn't look nothing like the tree I thought it was going to be. But I hope somebody found something in this. I hope. I prayed so hard that somebody would see what God can do. And if you will stay in God's work, you'll look back in your own life and you'll be like me and you'll say, man, how did I get to be what God wanted me to be? with what I done. I was a mistake when I was born. Here I am. God bless you guys. Thank you. I guess it's been a few years ago, and I've just been sitting on it, and uh, it ties in so so well with this. Uh, I'm a country boy, and I was out uh, I was out hunting. I deer hunt a lot. I love deer hunting. It's it's my favorite favorite thing to hunt is deer. Uh, Amen. And I I turkey hunt every now and then. Well, everybody, all my friends have been talking to me. They're you know you need to go turkey hunting. It's so fun. You know they they gobble. And so one year I was like. All right, I'll, I'll buy some turkey calls and, and I'll give it a go. And uh, I got all my stuff and went that morning before daylight and was uh, calling outridges. You can get an owl call and get them to God or a crow call. And, and I went from spot to spot to spot to spot to spot up on the ridges, down by the river, uh, all over the place, trying to. Uh, Get a turkey to gobble right behind it, located. And uh, I, out of frustration, I walked up this long ridge and I sat down underneath a big white oak. And I was talking to God, like, God, why, why, won't, why can't I get a turkey to gobble? You know, everybody says this is a blast. This is uh, <laughs> and, uh, about that time, the Spirit said, Well, you answered my call. Amen. We answer my call. I think God's asking us men this morning. Will we answer His call? Amen. He's got a, a purpose and a plan for each one of us. Will we? Will we answer His call this morning? Sure. Thank you.